Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Put your faith out to receive the grace of God. You get back in your seat. You stand in God again. You stand against the enemy who tells you God's mad at you and you're this and you're that and you're this and you're this and you're this. And then you keep walking your walk and running your race. And if you want to give the devil a nervous breakdown, that's the way to live. You can enter the rest of God about your own spiritual growth. You're going to see some things about that in just a minute. So we need to learn to live while seated. Now, you notice that when I sit in this chair, all the weight goes off of me, and all the weight is now on the chair. Now, Christ is seated in heavenly places. Revelation talks about he who sat upon the throne. And the whole premise behind this being seated thing, if, you don't, if you've never heard this, is that under the Old Testament law, the law represented works, 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 works. And people had to try to live a holy life, but they were doing it without grace because the dispensation of grace had not kicked in yet. It's not that God never gave anybody favor, or he never gave anybody grace, but by and large, the law was given to prove to people that they couldn't keep it so they would know that they needed a savior. So. There was all kinds of things, systems and things that went on, and there was a temple, had an outer court, an inner court, and the holy place. And the high priest met in the holy place with God, with the presence of God, once a year, and he went in to make confession and get forgiveness for all the sins of the people. And there were bells tied on the bottom of his robe and a rope around his waist. And the rope was kept outside by the people. And as long as he kept moving, they could hear the bells ring. And if the bells stopped, then they knew that he had done something to displease God, and he probably fell over dead. He didn't keep some of the laws, and he fell over dead. Now, the whole reason for that, I know it doesn't make much sense just talking about it, but the whole analogy here is that that old covenant system was totally a system of works. Works, 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 works. There was no chair in the holy place. There was no place for them to sit down. So it's very impressive to the Jew at that time who knew the word of God and understood that system that when Jesus died on the cross and the Bible says he accomplished the forgiveness of our sins and the riddance of our guilt, he sat down at the hand, at the right hand of God. <laughs> Finally, that's what Jesus meant when he said it's finished. Finally, that was finished, and then we start the amazing dispensation of grace that we live under now. And I share, this, this is just my way of sharing this. You know, sometimes people get all mixed up about grace. Grace is undeserved favor, but it's also the power of God coming to us to enable us to do what God wants us to do. You know, we don't live under the Ten Commandments as laws now, but God still does want us to do those 10 things and others besides, now they're more like promises. If you walk with me and you walk in my presence and you have a right relationship with me, you shall not put any other gods before me. Not like thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Now under the new covenant, they become like you won't murder, you won't steal, you will honor your father and mother. But one of those commandments is that we have to have rest. We have to have rest. Well, under the old system, they had one day a week that they needed to rest. Thank God we can live in rest now. God offers us a continual Sabbath rest that we can live in that supernatural rest of God all the time. We need to rest our bodies and one day a week is good, but it's not a legalistic thing now where you can't do this, you can't do that from six o'clock one day to six o'clock the next. Now God wants us to live in that supernatural rest. Now let me share something with you I just found out. Found it out from my own notes. I must have preached this sometime a long time ago. <laughs> Forgot all about it and then got in my notes and I thought, man, that is really good. <laughs> Wonder why I haven't said that more than once. Okay, now listen to this. In Genesis 1, 26 through 31, talks about like the, the final day of creation where God created Adam and Eve. Let's go there for a minute. Genesis 1, 
oh, you're going to love this? Matter of fact, I could just say amen after this and go home, and it would be worth you coming. Okay, Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image, after our likeness, and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame beasts, and over all the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the earth. So if I'm Adam, I'm already thinking, I've got a lot to take care of here. So God created man in his own image. In the image and the likeness of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the whole earth. Wow, God, the earth is pretty big. How long do I have to do this? And subdue it using all its vast resources in the service of God and man and have dominion over the fish, the birds, and every living creature and everything that moves upon the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in the fruit and you shall have them for food. And to all the animals on the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the ground, to everything in which there is the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food and it was so. Now, if I'm Adam, and maybe Adam wasn't like me, I don't know, but if I'm Adam, I'm thinking, man, I better get busy here. I mean the birds, the fish, the plants, the trees, the seeds, be fruitful, multiply, fill the whole earth. Man, I can't even imagine filling the garden, let alone the whole earth. I wonder when the grass needs to be mowed here. This is just, this is a lot going on. <laughs> now, I'm just playing with you, but I'm trying to make a point. You know that, I mean, he really did have a lot of responsibility. I mean, if you get right down to it, God gave Adam a lot of responsibility. I wonder how Adam felt when God told him to name all the animals. I mean, I don't have that many brain cells left in my life to do that. So I'm just saying that he could have been a little bit overwhelmed, but now watch. Here's the thing that I forgot that was in my notes that I obviously remembered at one time that now I have re-remembered. So on the sixth day, God created Adam and Eve. And chapter 2, verse 2, and on the seventh day, God ended his work with which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. Now, here's the thing that I saw. God showed me this. Adam was created on the sixth day, had a lot to do, maybe thought he needed to get to work, but Adam's first full day on the earth was a day of rest. That's better than your acting. You know why? Because yes, Adam was gonna to go to work, but God, there's a lesson here. You gotta get in the spirit to see this. God was trying to teach him that everything has to be done. Everything I want you to do, the whole call on your life, all the responsibility I'm giving you, raising your kids, making money, you being a good wife, being a good husband, all the things that you need to do. And then if you've got a ministry on top of it, you know, you gotta be an example to everybody in the whole world. You know, that's just like, you know. Whoa, God. But all of it had to be done from a position of rest. So first he said, I'm going to teach you how to rest. Then you can go to work. Come on, I like that. Adam was created on the sixth day, and his first full day here on the earth was a day of rest. My goodness, I about drove myself crazy trying to raise four kids. You know, none of them were alike. They all had different personalities. One of them was like me, and I really had a hard time with him because <laughs> I didn't know he was like me, and I thought he was just always challenging me and everything. One of them was so sloppy, and I had the, you are not going to leave in my house speech with her all the time. And then one of them was a real strong melancholy, and everything had to be perfect, and then one of them just he just wanted to have a good time. <laughs> he didn't care about nothing. You know, I, when he finally got out of school, I was happier than he was. I just thought, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, now he's the CEO of our ministry.
The guy, now listen, I mean, he had a really, really, really hard time in school, but he did, nobody knew back then that kids learned different ways, and he didn't really learn from books, he learned from hands-on. And I mean, now the guy can fix anything. I mean, I don't care what goes wrong, he can come around and fix it. And I'm like, where did you learn that? He's like, I don't know, I just kind of know how to do it. And then the one daughter that was so sloppy, I mean, I don't even know how she found herself, <laughs> let alone everything she had to leave with. That girl now is like my assistant and she helps take care of me. So let me just tell you, your kids will change. And there's no point in you driving yourself crazy while they're in the process. If you think they do nutty things, just remember some of the things you used to do when you were their age. And here you are, you survived. If you pray for your kids and you raise them in the Word of God, I don't care how crazy they act, eventually the Bible says, if you train them up in the way they should go, when they're old, they will not depart from it. Amen. Amen. Entering the rest of God. My, my, my. You know, we need to learn how to live the way that we begin our walk with God. So let's look at how we begin. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. How many are convinced that you need to study this thing about entering the rest of God and learn how to live more from that position of rest? Doesn't it sound great? Wow. Okay, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by free grace, God's unmerited favor that you're saved, delivered from judgment, and made a partaker of Christ's salvation through your faith. How were you saved? By grace, through faith. By grace, through faith. And that's the same way you live. By grace, through faith. How do we now keep the Word of God? How do we walk in the Word of God? How do we become what God wants us to become? By grace, through faith. God's grace is the power that we need. It's not just undeserved favor, but it's the power of God coming into our lives to enable us to do what He has asked us to do. Under the old covenant, they didn't have the kind of help that we get. They were told to do it. They failed. They had to make sacrifices. It was a constant system of works, 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 works. Thank God Jesus came as a perfect sacrifice. He fulfilled the law. He died in our place. He took our sin. He took our punishment. He took our guilt. And now the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 6 that we are seated in Christ. We are seated with God in Christ. And so if he's seated, I'm seated. If he died, I died. If he was raised, I was raised. If he's dead to sin, I'm dead to sin. There's so many scriptures I could take you to tonight, but the thing you gotta understand is we're in Christ, and he saw us in him before the foundation of the world. He knew every person that was ever gonna believe, and we're in him. So if I've got a dollar bill in a book, and the book gets burned up, the dollar bill gets burned up too. So that means that everything that happened to Christ, legally, maybe not experientially yet, but positionally and legally, it's mine, by covenant with God. Now I'm learning to walk it out in my everyday life. The Bible says, for example, that we're dead to sin. Well, I can tell you, I don't always feel dead to sin. Sometimes I just feel like, yeah, I really would like to just slap you upside the head. <laughs> I mean, I really would just love to smack you and I'd love to stay mad at you for the next 100 years and tell everybody what a jerk you are. <laughs> but I know that that's not what God wants me to do now. So. Now I can either try to be good, and that don't work, because no matter how much you try, if you leave God out of the equation, you're gonna get worn out from your trying, you're gonna get frustrated, and God's gonna stand back and let you fail, because he's not gonna let us do anything successfully without his help. But if I go to God and I say, you know what, I know that that's, I know that that's, really, that's not really what I want. I don't really want to stay mad. I don't really want to talk about them. That's what my flesh wants, but my new, my new man, the new person you've made me to be, I want to do what you want me to do. But God, I can't do it without you. I need grace 
So what I'm doing, my faith is out. My faith is not out for me to be able to accomplish, but my faith is out to receive the grace of God to enable me to do what God wants me to do. Now God gets all the credit. And I like to say it like this, and I hope this, you receive this well. You know, grace is not an excuse to live a sloppy life and get by with it. It's the power not to have to. Amen? Thank God we don't have to live a sinful life. Number one, because we've got a new heart we don't even want to. And if we'll learn to have a real intimate tight relationship with God, then through that relationship with him, you see, if you're just going to church, going home, going to church, going home, reading a couple chapters every day so God don't get mad at you, praying 10 minutes, going to church, going home, fulfilling all the little rules and obligations that somebody's given you or you've set up for yourself, that's not relationship. But when you have deep, intimate, personal relationship with God, then through that relationship with God, more than anything, you wanna please him. And if you just learn to go to him and ask him for the help, even when you fall down, he'll get you back. And then you go back to sitting because you say, I'm in relationship. God's not mad at me because I made a mistake. He already knew I was gonna make this mistake before I knew I was gonna make this mistake. And he's not mad at me. He loves me unconditionally so I can rest in him. Now I can get back up. I can stand again. I can walk again in God and I can run my race. But we've always gotta go back to the sitting, 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 sitting. By grace are you saved through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves. It's not of your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but it is a gift of God. Not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what anyone can possibly do, so no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. Now, those of you that have received Christ as your Savior, I want you to think about the time in your life, if you can remember, a time, some people are blessed to just know God all their life and they don't even really know when they came to that conclusion. They were raised in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and it's, they've had faith since they were little. But most of us know a time in our life when it was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't live like this anymore. I can't carry this weight and this burden anymore. God, you've got to do something. Now, those of you that are here tonight and you have not yet received Christ as your Savior, you may even be a church member, but that doesn't mean that you're born again. The Bible doesn't say in order to enter heaven, you must go to church. It says you must be born again. And that means that you lean wholly and completely on God for your salvation. You trust him for the forgiveness of your sins. You trust him that when you sin and the guilty feelings come, that you don't have to bear that burden anymore because he bore that burden. And those of you here tonight that have not yet made that decision, you need to understand this verse. You don't have to go out and get good enough to be saved. You can't do that. You don't need to put it off until another time when you think you've got a few more things straightened out in your life. Tonight needs to be the night. And all you see, you can't do anything to receive salvation. Receive is not a doing word. Receive is a receiving word. And everything in our walk with God comes from and starts with a, it is done, not a you must do. Do you understand that? It starts with a, it is done. Jesus said, it is done. I've done it all for you. Now you believe my word and through your faith, my grace will come in and enable you to do what needs to be done. I, you know, I have changed so much. I mean, I tell Dave sometimes, I mean, that man must feel like he's been married to 20 women over the 48 years we've been married. Because I mean, I was just like pretty much a nutcase when we first got married. And I have changed so much. And yeah, I mean, I guess I could sit here and say, well, yeah, well, I did this and I did that and I did this. But you know what? The few little puny pitiful things that I did. I mean, we finally get to the point where we just say, it's God. It's just God. I mean, it's just God. But I had, to, I had to learn how to live seated. And if I went to a service and I heard a message about my mouth, 
<laughs> and even if I prayed, okay, God, I know I can't do it on my own, help me. And I get up the next morning and I'm meditating on the scriptures, thought about them this morning, quoted them this morning, oh God, may the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, big step on your side. Put a watcher in my mouth, oh God, lest I sin against you with my tongue. I mean, you know, I know the word is the power. But that still doesn't guarantee me that I'm not gonna make a mistake with my mouth that day. And when I do, I can go right back to sitting. Whoops. <laughs> See, sometimes you almost miss your seat. I can go right back to sitting. Okay, God, my heart was not to do that. I'm sorry. You know every word in my tongue that is still unuttered. I had a plan for holding this today, but maybe it works out better in your overall plan for me to see my weakness today. Maybe if I did too good, I'd get too proud. You know, the Bible teaches us that God consigns to all men a certain amount of weakness. And you know why? Because if we didn't have that, we would, it wouldn't take very long and we would not think we needed him. And more than anything, God wants us dependent on him. I'm sorry, but as long as you're in this earth, you are going to make mistakes. And the thing is, you go back to looking at your heart. If it wasn't your heart to do that, and you're truly sorry, and you're willing to turn away from it, that's all that you need to do. Now you put your faith out to receive the grace of God. You get back in your seat. You stand in God again. You stand against the enemy who tells you God's mad at you and you're this and you're that and you're this and you're this and you're this. And then you keep walking your walk and running your race. And if you want to give the devil a nervous breakdown, that's the way to live. Amen. Well, as God's children, we have an opportunity to enter his supernatural rest and to live our lives there. You know, it's not a rest from work, but it's a rest in work. When we rely on his leadership and strength, we're equipped to do our responsibility. To enter the rest of God doesn't mean that we just sit around and do nothing. It means that we do what we do with a peace and a rest that only God can give. This community likes boys, so they want their boys to go to school first. The girls, they don't have any, any value when it comes to education for them. So if they can get some money for her and not have the burden of having to care for her, it helps the family. The flags that you see on the homes over my shoulder represent a long-standing tradition that is very difficult on girls. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school and they'll actually go through different activities, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So they teach them different things about sexuality and so on. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. That's the key. And helping these girls by taking them into a program <laughs> called Imagine Hope. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families. This is a good hat. Were you afraid when you thought that you were going to have to be married? 
some of my friends, they are already married now, but they are used to suffer in that marriage. So if myself, I was afraid to be married while I'm still young, but because of this program, my mom, she didn't take me through the marriage, but she bring me here so that I can proceed with my education, so that I can help her in future, change her situation. I, I'm so grateful. I wish I could bring everyone here and let them see the impact of what's happening. Um, and I'm grateful for it because we should give and we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. We are helping young women like this all over the world. Help us to guide, restore, and love young girls. Your designated gift today, if you choose, can go to Project Girl, or you can give toward water, you can give toward feeding, and do something that you know will make a difference. And so I'm inviting you to join us in partnership. Help us glorify God and share Christ. Help us help hurting people. Help us feed the poor and get the gospel to people that don't yet know what we know. You can check us out on JoyceMeyer.org and find out all that you need to know about partnership or you can call the ministry. God bless you and thank you for praying about this. Elk gebed and elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. It's very painful and difficult to go through life with a wounded soul. I know because for years I lived that way due to being sexually abused by my father when I was a young child. But I learned that God could heal even my deepest hurts if I would just open my heart up and let him in. And in my new book called Healing the Soul of a Woman, you too can discover how to allow God into those wounded places in your life. God has a brand new beginning for you and you do not have to spend the rest of your life hurting. Bestel nu innerlijke genezing van de vrouw via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Bestel ook het werkboek bij het boek. Joyce koppelt gerelateerde bijbelteksten en de diepgaande vragen aan de specifieke hoofdstukken die je kunnen helpen de innerlijke genezing te ontvangen waarna je verlangt. Hoe zit het met een dagelijkse inspiratie? Inspirerende gedachten levert de dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce per e-mail. Meld je gratis aan.